Dear colleagues, on behalf of the Institute uh, for Philosophy and Social Theory and our traditional partners from the Center for Ethics, Law and Applied Philosophy and Center for Advanced Studies of Southeastern Europe, University of Rijeka, I am very pleased to welcome Tamar Meisels to Belgrade and to our institute. Uh, today, Tamar will give a lecture titled Targeted Killing with Drones, Old Arguments, New Technologies. This event will be chaired by my colleague Aleksandar Fatic, but before we move on to the lecture, allow me to introduce uh, our today's guest. Tamar Meisels is a professor of political theory in the Department of Political Science in Tel Aviv University. She earned her uh, PhD in politics from Oxford University in 2001. Her primary research and teaching interests include liberal nationalism, territorial rights, and the philosophical questions surrounding war and terrorism. She is the author of Territorial Rights in 2005 and republished in 2009, The Trouble with Terror, published, published by Cambridge University Press in 2008, Contemporary Just War Theory and Practice, published by Rutledge in 2017, and she is also a co-editor with Michael L. Gross of uh, Soft War, uh, The Ethics of Unarmed Conflict, published also by Cambridge University Press in 2017. In order to give a wider context of this lecture, I will now provide the audience with summaries of, of Tamar's most recent, but also most prominent, publications. In Trouble with Terror, Liberty, Security, and the Response to Terrorism, Meisels argues that regardless of its professed cause, terrorism is diametrically opposed to the requirements of liberal morality and can only be defended at the expense of relinquishing the most basic of liberal commitments. Meisels opposes those who express sympathy and justification for Islamist, particularly Palestinian terrorism, and terrorism allegedly carried out on behalf of developing nations. But, at the same time, she also opposes those who would tolerate any reduction in civil liberties in exchange for greater security. Similarly, in contemporary just war theory and practice, Tamar offers a renewed defense of traditional just war theory. She develops a detailed defense of civilian immunity the moral equality of soldiers, and the related dichotomy between jus ad bellum and jus in bell, and argues that these principles taken together amount to a morally coherent ethics of war. In this sense, this project is traditional or orthodox. In another sense, however, it's, it's highly relevant to the modern world. While the first part of the book defends the just war tradition against its revisionist critics, the second part applies it to an array of timely issues. Civil war, economic uh, warfare, uh, excessive harm to civilians, preemptive military strikes, and state-sponsored assassination, which require applying just war theory in practice. Among Tamar's latest publica publications is also an edited volume named Soft War, The Ethics of Unarmed, uh, Unarmed Conflict, edited together with Michael L. Gross from University of Haifa, which explores often overlooked types of harms. Namely, contemporary international conflicts increasingly evolve, uh, involve the use of unarmed tactics, employing softer alternatives or supplements to kinetic power that have not been sufficiently addressed by the ethics of international law. Soft war tactics include cyber warfare and economic san sanctions, media warfare, and propaganda as well as non-violent resistance as it plays out uh, in, uh, in uh, civil disobedience, boycotts, and lawfare. While the just war tradition has much to say about hard war, bullets, bombs, and bayonets, it is virtually silent on the subject of soft war. The ethics of unarmed conflict illuminates the neglected, uh, this neglected aspect of international conflict. As we can see, Tamar does not shy away from provocative philosophical topics. However, it is also important to note that even this relatively short overview of her work clearly illustrates her focus on concrete issues and problems that occur in both in politics and in war, which is, as uh, her lecture will soon show, 
with increasingly fast advancement of technolo technology is becoming an ever more important task of political theory. So now I give the word to Alexander. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Sergeant. I should like to join Sergeant in welcoming Tamar very warmly to the Institute. This is a, an exceptional opportunity for us to discuss with Tamar a, a, a truly fascinating paper that is before us, the paper entitled Targeting, tar Targeted Killing with Drones, Old, Old Arguments, New Technologies. Uh, Tamar is uh, one of the very few authors uh, who write about drones today uh, who uh, do not hide behind technical language and technical arguments. Uh, she speaks very frankly, very openly, and in a very readable way about a highly controversial topic, both in military doctrine and in military ethics, and defends the use of drones uh, as uh, an instrument which has the capacity to reduce the ability of terrorist groups to inflict damage on civilians, while at the same time being capable of avoiding many of the ethical dilemmas which are typically associated with the use of drones if they're interpreted correctly. So without further ado, I pass the floor to Tamar. Tamar, please shoot away. <laughs> thank you. First of all, thank you for inviting me. And I'm very honored and, and delighted to be back in, in Belgrade. Um, OK, so as you can see, uh, the question raised recently by Michael Walter, targeted killing. We all have old arguments for and against it. But what about targeted killing with drones? And generally speaking, as the US and Israel continuously um, confront terrorism, they're increasingly, um, they increasingly find themselves under attack for their method of assassinating terrorist leaders, now particularly with drones. And targeted killing um, has been compared with uh, political assassination, which is internationally illegal, uh, with extrajudicial execution, and with terrorism itself. Nevertheless, former President uh, Obama um, continuously stated and demonstrated that this was his favored counterterrorism measure. The current administration seems only to have increased the use of targeted killing with drones. Israel has long resorted to this tactic, which it heightened after the outbreak of the second intifada. And of course, Israel is a long time user of drones, though not all targeted killings, or not even most targeted killings um, in Gaza have been performed by drones. Targeted killing, of course, can be carried out by conventional air aircrafts, by ground forces. It can be um, inflicted by bullets, by bombs, or by poison, as in one case of an Israeli targeted killing in Jordan. Mostly, though, now, and especially in the American case, targeted killings are performed by drones, operated at distance. So the question that I want to ask today is what can just war theory, right, this old tradition, teach us about targeted killing with drones? Um, Michael Walter recently takes up this question, restating his old, old arguments for targeted killing, but at the same time expressing some very new reservations about targeted killing with, um, with drones. So I'm going to begin here with my old argument in favor of targeted killing. But mostly, I want to address the various sources of discomfort raised by Walter and other theorists regarding the use of drones for targeted killing. But first, just targeted killing. Now, the key to the argument that targeted killing is a legitimate um, action, that it's not political assassination or extrajudicial killing or terrorism, is the rather contentious um, uh, proposition that a state of war or armed conflict exists between states and terrorist organizations, which brings the full privileges of belligerency into play. And here already I di diverge a little bit uh, from Walter, because Walter claims that targeted killing with drones is a type of use of force short of war, what he calls use ad vim. But um, I argue, following the Israeli Supreme Court, the American Supreme Court, and the political leaders of these countries, that um, the laws of armed conflict come into play um, in the case, cases of confronting terrorist organizations. And more generally, I argue that where, where international law is unclear 
on the status of the conflict. We ought to adopt an interpretation of what war is that um, doesn't exclude the wars we're actually fighting. Right? So if the laws of armed conflict don't apply to Israel and Gaza, to the United States and Al-Qaeda and associated forces, right, then it, it sort of makes the laws of war relatively um, obsolete. Because these are the wars that we have today. Now if you accept that a state of war exists between Western states and terrorist organizations, then in war, when one's engaged in war or in armed conflict, any combatant, any belligerent, um, may be killed in war under circumstances that far outstrip ordinary self-defense. So we have Walter's classic examples. You can kill a soldier when he's showering, when he's um, lighting a cigarette, when he's relaxing um, on base, and so on. Terrorists are unquestionably combatants or at the very least, they are irregular combat combatants, or as the Israeli Supreme Court calls them, civilians who are not unengaged in hostilities. Command their commanders, organizers, recruiters, operatives of, um, of the struggle. At the very least, they're an unprotected type of civilian. Um, so, Terrorism, I'm sorry, targeted killing is not terrorism because it doesn't kill at random. It targets particular military operatives, just like killing soldiers in war. Terrorism, Walter tells us, kills at random. Um, targeted killing does not. Targeted killing is also not political assassination because political assassination, which is also not random, targets civilians, it targets particular political officials or um, officials of the regime, which it opposes. But these people have the protected status of civilians, whereas terrorists do not. Um, targeted killing, oh, sorry. Targeted killing actually retains the moral advantages of assassination, right? It's um, targeted, so it distinguishes between people who are the target and between uh, ordinary civilians. But unlike uh, political assassination, which is illegal and usually immoral, targeted killing kills belligerents. It doesn't kill civilians. Um, all right, so one objection that's often raised with targeted killing is that um, there's too much of it. Why not try and capture the terrorists and put them on trial? This is where the extrajudicial killing um, opposition arises. But targeted killing isn't just extrajudicial execution. It's not execution at all. In war, there's no requirement to capture and try combatants. And so targeted killing um, is not extrajudicial uh, execution. What else is argued against targeted killing? Um, aside from the fact that it's argued that it's political assassination, extrajudicial killing, and terrorism. Um, it's also argued that there's too much collateral damage. Right? So these are, the, these are the main oppositions to targeted killing. My argument is it's not political assassination because it targets liable combatants. It's not extrajudicial execution because there's no wartime requirement to capture combatants. It's not terrorism because it distinguishes between um, uh, soldiers and civilians or combatants and civilians. And as far as collateral damage is concerned, in war, remember that armies are um, authorized to attack and kill enemy combatants in ways that foreseeably cause collateral damage as long as, um, as, long as the collateral damage is proportionate in relation to the military advantage anticipated. In fact, the essence of pinpointed attack, of targeted killing, is that it avoids collateral damage to a much greater extent than other wartime options. So there's less collateral damage if you target a terrorist operative of Hamas in Gaza than if you um, uh, bomb the area or if you send in ground forces. And the same thing I assume is true in the American case as well. So to cut a very, very long argument short, in principle, I argue that targeting terrorists in the course of an armed conflict as a preventative measure rather than as punishment um, is a legitimate defensive act subject to the usual necessity, proportionality, and reasonable chance of success conditions. 
Now, what type of success are we looking for? Um, we all know that targeted killing doesn't annihilate terrorism. It doesn't solve the problem of terrorism in one go. But the idea is, and, and we were discussing this a little bit before, the idea is um, disruption and decapitation of terrorist organizations, deterrence, weakening the organization, forcing their leaders into hiding. Remember the terrorist organizations that don't really have the kind of um, clear structure that armies do, rely to a great extent on um, the charisma and the leadership of particular individuals. And so it's believed that um, killing them or trying to kill them forces them into hiding, uh, weakens the organization, uh, restricts their movements, and of course demoralizes their operatives. The idea that the long arm of Israel or the United States or um, the UK is out there waiting to pluck them out at any moment, that any phone call could be an, explosive, an explosion, um, and so on. That, that's the general idea. Um, moreover, judged as a wartime measure, not as a peacetime action, judged as a wartime measure, um, Targeted killing is a particularly limited and fastidious form of combat that aims at a liable combatant um, and tries at least to spare civilians. Targeted killing, I argue, is our best shot at combating terrorism at the lowest cost to human life. All right, so this is a short, very, very short summary of um, what I argue about targeted killing in, in the book that you mentioned. Um, and in various articles from the 2000s. Up to here, I think Michael Walter would agree, with the exception um, that I don't think Walter sees every action of the United States um, as, as a wartime action. Again, he has this idea of use ad vim, of measures short of war. But what about targeted killing with drones? And this is the really new question. So if we talked about targeted killing, again, from about 2001 onward, targeted killing with drones is a little bit different. Now, there's no essential connection between the issue of targeted killing, I'll talk a little about this, between the issue of targeted killing and um, drone warfare. But de facto, the two issues are contingently connected. So that most of the debates now about targeted killing are debates about targeted killing. Um, with drones. And here I'd like to offer a few brief comments um, that I'm not so sure Michael Walzer would agree with anymore. The first thing, and I think this is very important to say, regardless of academic debates, drones are here to stay. And there's this American film, Good Kill, um, and so somebody says there, drones aren't going anywhere. They're, they're, in fact, they're going everywhere. So we're talking about what to do with drones, how to use drones, how much to use drones, but in the real world, nobody is really debating if to use drones. So um, it doesn't matter if we have a debate and we decide that drones really aren't a moral way of killing people or we're, we've lost our old-fashioned uh, um, uh, military values and so on. Drones are here. It's more a question of what do we do about it. Um, moreover, possibly very soon everyone will have them. And that's something we see a lot in the literature. It's something that worries Michael Walter, and he's right to worry about it. It also worries Jeremy Waldron. Uh, we know that Hezbollah uh, has drones, and here and there they try and fly a drone um, over Israel, and they're not going to be the only organization with drones. We certainly know, and, and, and Waldron writes about this a little bit, that big states like uh, Russia and China and so on can have drones. Um, However, I'm going to question whether it's very feasible for them to use these drones over, at least over American and Israeli skies, and whether we really ought to be so worried about this. And this is my second point about drones. So the first point is that drones just aren't going away. But my second point about drones, and here I realize this is very contentious, is that drones, both morally and strategically, are weapons for good and strong states. When I say good states, I mean relatively good states. We all know that good states don't always act well, right? Um, including our own states. But there's an asymmetry here that arguably works in favor of drones. Uh, running an effective drone program, and this is a really important point, 
requires rather sophisticated satellite systems, large infrastructure, trained manpower, where state level air superiority is already established. And this is something that's somewhat missed. It's not that if you get a little drone, I just flew over, flew over here on some Israeli charter, and one of the things on the duty-free list is, is a drone. It's a drone that you can fly at the beach uh, and so on. It's not that if you have a, a machine like that, everyone can get one. A drone program like the United States operates in, in Afghanistan, in Yemen, and so on, is, is a huge production. Um, now, it's not only that you need state level air superiority, it's that it has to work in cooperation with the drone operators. Uh, and, and Walter makes this point as well. Sure, the drone operators in Nevada are not risking themselves, but there are an awful lot of people working, who, some of whom are at some risk. Now, given the expense and complexity and the need for um, state level uh, air superiority, um, it's very difficult to imagine that everyone will have them in the sense that some of these political theorists are talking about. So sure, maybe Hamas will have a drone, but there isn't much that they can do with it. And I argue that morally, this is an advantage. Drones are weapons of states, and they're weapons of states that want to distinguish between combatants and civilians. They're weapons of non-terrorist states. Because if what you want is to kill a lot of civilians in order to frighten people, if what you want is to do um, terrorism, then much less sophisticated weapons and much less expensive weapons will do that trick. Um, drones would be entirely ineffective and not even particularly desirable in the hands of non-state actors and their patrons who are aiming to kill civilians. Um, all right, so my, my point here is that you have to want to achieve use in bellow objectives. You have to want to distinguish very sharply between particular targets and aim narrowly and try and spare civilians in order for drones to be a good weapon for you. If you want to carry out a terrorist attack, you don't need drones, and drones aren't very good for you. They're not effective for that. They're pinpointed weapons. Now, strategically, outside of morally, drones are ineffective for terrorist organizations who are targeting big, strong states. Um, they're targeting states like Israel and the United States and Britain and, and France, and these states have anti-aircraft capability. So if they get drones, we'll shoot them down. Um, Without complete state-level air superiority, drones are incredibly ineffective. Imagine a slow, lumbering vehicle um, that can easily be shot down by the, by the most basic state-level anti-aircraft uh, equipment. That's strategically. Morally, again, drones offer a built-in advantage to states that try to distinguish between combatants and civilians over murderous terrorist organizations that kill indiscriminately. All right, so point one was the drones aren't going away. Point do, two is the drones are advantageous both morally and strategically to good states. Point three is that given those two previous points, the drones aren't going away and that they're essentially a, well, a, a weapon suited for relatively, relatively good states, the relevant question is how, not if, to use them. And the answer comes from just war theory very loud and clear. The laws and customs of war supply the answer. Aim narrowly at identified <laughs> named combatants, sparing civilians whenever possible. Any alternative use of force with other weapons would cause more harm. Now, quite a diverse set of just war theorists, I don't know how many of you have studied contemporary just war theory, but quite a diverse set of just war theorists make exactly this point. They agree on this one point. Um, drones have the capacity to refine rather than dull our moral, cap our moral sensibilities and to increase compliance with use and bellow um, rules. They can enhance the compliance with laws about distinction and proportionality. They can minimize co uh, collateral damage. And this is a point that you can find in Walter and in McMahon for all the differences between these two um, strains of thought and in various other um, theorists like Daniel Stockman and, and um, various other just war theorists in both camps. 
Um, if drones are not used to this end, in other words, if we don't use drones in order to aim narrowly and spare civilians, then people are to blame, not the machines that they employ. It's not the drone's fault, right? If, I don't know, um, a leader of a country isn't careful enough about targeting the specific target narrowly and there's a lot of collateral damage, that's not the machine's fault. The machine can actually help us to comply um, better with, with use in bellow demands. Um, but as we all know, solving one moral problem may entail raising another one. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen the NYU report, Living Under Drones. And part of the problem that in order to do what Walter and McMahon and Statman and I claim that drones should do and can do, which is to target very narrowly, you have to have surve surveillance drones hovering in the air, waiting to pick out the target when, it, I don't know if anybody saw the film, but when there's no little girl around or when there are no civilians in the area. And the hovering drones buzz and hum, and you're living in this terrifying situation where you know that you have an American drone or, or an Israeli drone um, hovering around you that can shoot at any minute. Now, Walter, interestingly, actually questions this document. And he says, how is this possible? It accuses the, the drone strikes of being sudden death from the sky. And at the same time, uh, it says that they're hovering and humming at an audible distance. How can it be um, that you hear them for days and days, but that, there's, but that they threaten sudden death from the sky? So Walter is always right. But the point is that um, it's, there are two types of drones. The surveillance drones are the ones that you hear, the ones that you know that you're in a region where America is looking to target some Al-Qaeda operative and you hope that you're not under it, right? And it's the predator drones that actually cause the um, uh, sudden and surprising and scary uh, death from the sky. And I have to say, actually, as an Israeli, that this is something that we have to take into account. Right? I have no experience of living under drones. I have little experience of living under effect, un, ineffective missiles, under Saddam Hussein's scuds in the 90s and under Hamas um, ineffective rockets. And even though you know that the statistical chance of being hit is very low, the experience is terrifying, especially for children, especially, right? So I can't deny that this is a real cost. It's real collateral damage, even though the effect is largely psychological. Nevertheless, I'll argue this, that one significant factor in assessing the harm to civilians in keeping with just war theory and international law is, um, hold on, is whether the harm is intended, right? Whether the harm is intended or not intended. <coughs> Certainly, Walter is right that drones ought not to be deployed deliberately, and now I'm quoting from Walter, to hover visibly and audibly precisely in order to terrify the villagers so that they expe uh, expel Taliban militants hiding among them. If we're using drones in that way, that's not allowed. Just war theory cannot allow you to use a machine in order to terrify people, civilians, so that they expel the militants. Um, so, the psychological collateral harm caused by drones is justifiable only to the extent that it's sincerely a byproduct of the attempt to spare civilians. In other words, that it's a sincere byproduct of um, the war on terrorism. Moreover, unlike the collateral damage that we experience or that people, civilians experience under terrorism, the frightening effects of drones are primarily the byproduct of the attempt to spare civilians. In other words, the humming and buzzing is there in order to focus narrowly on combatants. They survey there for days in order to single out the combatants and try and spare civilians. So what I'm saying here on the bottom line is this. Yes, there's psychological collateral damage as a result of drones. Yes, we have to take it into account. And the relative perspective is the perspective of the villagers on the ground, not the people who assess the situation in Nevada or in Washington. Nevertheless, collateral damage is legitimate in war, both concrete collateral damage and psychological effects. Moreover, the collateral damage of drones is a byproduct of their attempt to spare civilians, of their attempt to aim narrowly and protect civilians. 
So that's another advantage in, the fav in favor of drones. And now I'm going to get to what I think you're going to criticize me on, Alexander. Um, isn't there nonetheless something about targeted killing from a distance that makes drones particularly objectionable and prone to misuse? Now, historically, there's no doubt that flying cannonballs, killing people, tearing them apart across the battlefield must have seemed like um, remotely controlled weapons. Uh, unmanned aerial vehicles are, however, entirely distanced from the battlefield. They're not across the battlefield. They're in another country. Um, though, again, not necessarily everyone involved in maintaining and operating the drone program um, is, is in Nevada. Some of them are much closer to the battlefield situation. Nevertheless, it's something very close to an advantage of risk-free combat. And this bothers a lot of people. Various writers have suggested that riskless warfare is a bad in itself. Um, either because it renders one oppo one's opponent non-threatening and therefore non-liable to attack. This is Paul Kahn's argument. Uh, or else because it's dishonorable, it's unfair, it's lacking in military virtues and military valor. Um, some objections to drones, um, those that concern asymmetrical warfare, distant engagement, the loss of old-fashioned military virtues, defenseless targets, facing a faceless death. Some of these apply to long, long range missiles as well, right? So if you're thinking, if your problem with drones is that um, there's a lacking in military virtue, that the combatant isn't placing himself in danger or risk, that someone faces faceless death from the sky, sudden strike of lightning and so forth, all of this is true of long range missiles. If, I don't know, a missile hurled from Tehran to Tel Aviv is a very faceless weapon. Um, it also applies to quite a bit of targeting from the air, right? Even if in a manned vehicle, when you bomb an area, the pilot isn't really at risk. So all of this is not really new. Um, but there are also a number of answers that have been put forward to these, uh, to these objections most notably from B.J. Strasser and Danny Statman. So where are we here? Um, drones are economical. Morally, they have the capacity to minimize casualties among civilians and combatants. And financially, they're relatively cost effective for states to um, deploy. And that leaves a lot more money for military expenditure that can be used for welfare and so forth. This is um, B.J. Strasser's argument. Um, now, and this is what you see here up on the slide, um, in targeted killing and drone, wa uh, drone warfare, Michael Walzer worries that even if all of this is true, even if B.J. Strasser and Danny Statman and arguments like that are true, the capacity for riskless warfare makes drones dangerously tempting. And I think that this is part of what bothers a lot of people, that if you can kill people at a distance without risking, if Israel doesn't have to think we might lose soldiers, we might have soldiers kidnapped, if the United States doesn't have to think about body bags and um, veterans' hospitals and so on, they're going to kill many more people because it doesn't cost us anything. It doesn't cost the politician any kind of criticism at home because people at home don't care because it's not killing Americans. And the ability to kill the enemy without risking our soldiers may make killing too easy, Walzer argues, leading to a re relaxation of the targeting rules and actually increasing warfare. I think that that sums up the concern better than anybody else does. That if it's too easy, we'll do it more. And we won't be careful enough about not killing people. And I'm quoting from Walter, imagine a war in which there won't be any casualties on our side. No veterans who spend years in VA hospitals, no funerals, compare with Vietnam, which is what Walter wrote just in Unjust Wars about, right? Uh, the easiness of fighting with drones should make us uneasy. This is a dangerously te tempting technology. All right, so that's, that's Walter. And I agree with him. The diagnosis, appears painfully plausible. Zero risk 
warfare encourages trigger happiness, right? It's too easy. But the appropriate remedy, the solution is not clear. It seems entirely preposterous, even somewhat grotesque, to place your own soldiers at risk, and I don't know how long, how much contact you have with young people who are in wheelchairs because they fought a war or whatever, right? So to place young people at that kind of risk of life and limb, just in order to maintain old-fashioned military um, values. Walter doesn't suggest anything like that, right? He doesn't suggest that we revert to low-tech weapons and place our soldiers at greater risk uh, rather than use drones. He just raises a concern. Walter never suggests this. In fact, the only appropriate response that's in keeping with use in Bello is actually more targeted warfare, or rather warfare that's more targeted. Using drone capacity to focus their aim as, na as narrowly as humanly and technologically possible and attempting to hit the enemy target, the liable combatant, and no one else. Any other use of drones is, I'm sorry, any other use of drones is entirely unacceptable, unacceptable on just war theory. But then any other use of a slingshot or a bow and arrow is also unacceptable. Um, complaints about the misuse of drones, the overuse of drones, uh, intentionally or negligibly terrorizing populations ought rightly to be aimed at the particular policies and policy makers rather than at the technology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tamar. Uh, before I open, I would like to sort of uh, ask a, a warming up question uh, which relates to the initial, um, the first step of your argument which is basically bringing in the prerogatives of warfare as opposed to force short of war, uh, which basically solves many of the problems from the outset. Uh, I wonder, if, when you read Walzer, you see that Walzer writes very much uh, as an American. He, he writes very much on behalf of what he thinks is a, a, a good state, a good American state. In one place in his artic article about drones, he says, it may be justified to kill a political leader in Yemen, but it is by definition never justifiable to kill the president of the US, because the US is what you call a good state. You know, and Yemen is supposedly a, you know, a problematic, he calls it an insecure state. Right. Now, uh, my, my, I wonder, I, I, it seems to me that the nature of terror, the nature of these asymmetrical threats is, is partly in the eye of the beholder uh, because it's one vision for Israel to fight terror and to understand terror as warfare and it's a different thing for America to, to interpret the fight against terror as warfare because Israel is surrounded by a sea of Arabs and the everyday life in Israel is a, a life with a constant uh, awareness of the threat whereas America is surrounded by the ocean and uh, its, its actions uh, against terrorists across the ocean are largely planned industrial exercises of in, you know, inflicting damage on people who are considered to be threats to their projected interests abroad. So for Americans it may be more natural to think about uh, anti-terror policies as force short of war, whereas for Israel it is more natural to think about it as warfare. And do, do you think that that can be uh, inculcated in a philosophical right. argument at all? Uh, yes, no. I think it's right. But what you have to bear in mind is that there is no category called Dius Advim. In other words, it's a very interesting, Walter creates the category, but in traditional just war theory and in traditional thinking about war, you have war and you have peace. Um, so, and also, so, so I agree with Walter. I, I, Walter's point, and you're right, it makes more sense in the United States, is that there's something here that isn't exactly peace and isn't exactly war. Um, and then we have to think what to do with it. My argument is that it's much more like war in terms of the uh, rules that should apply than it is like peace. Um, legally, the American Supreme Court does treat it as a non-international armed conflict. The Israeli court uh, treats the conflict as an international armed conflict. The reason the United States adopts the non-international armed conflict model is because even less restricting rules apply to non-international armed conflict than apply legally to international armed conflict. Um, laws of armed conflict don't really have a category of use ad vim. So yes, I think you're right. I think Walter's perspective is different because he's an American, absolutely. 
Um, but I still think that if you're going to try and regulate this, this looks a lot more like war than like peace. Thank you. Please go on with the questions. Yo. Yo, okay. Yeah. I, I didn't think that I, I read it the first, but it's in a very topic that I am dealing with a lot. And actually, how how much time do I have? Uh, depending on the interest. In <laughs> okay. Okay. I, I will be. I have a lot of, of, of questions. Uh, actually, I would exclude the issue of terrorism from the whole thing and concentrate on the war and technology. That's something that uh, uh, I'm interested in here. In. And uh, war is uh, now uh, going through a conceptual change, uh, making obsolete, but I think it's uh, entirely wrong, the distinction between Yusuf Bello and Yusuf Bello. Many very important values, human values, uh, they will be lost because of that. But Walzer, in his uh, seminal book, Just and Just War, on page 41, says the following Without the equal right to kill, war as a rule governed activity would disappear and be replaced by crime and punishment, by evil conspiracies and military law enforcement. Many decades later, he said in the uh, uh, short uh, paper uh, entitled as Kosovo, uh, that if you are not ready to die, you don't have a right to kill. So that, that, that's uh, some, somehow the, the frame from which I, I start, uh, some kind of, of symmetry. Technology on the other side, is supposed to be value neutral. So uh, you said uh, dr drones are there to stay. They are a new weapon. Uh, weapons are always staying, uh, except some. So this depends. Poison gas. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah but that, that, that's, that, that might be, if I have enough time, uh, part of, of my question. What's the difference between drones, uh, can't, uh, at, at, at the, there is a place in Kant uh, saying the snipers are uh, yeah. something that should be illegitimate uh, in the same sense in which poisoning wells is. So uh, we find, and you and Walzer both have that uh, argument that uh, poisons are uh, something that could not be legitimized, but with very strange argumentation, not as the one with torture, but because of changing wind, winds, in effect, uh, uh, the winds may, may change and uh, you may kill yeah, the, the, your yeah. own. But uh, still, uh, my main question might be uh, the following, there, there will be some others uh, after that, uh, that uh, if technology is uh, uh, there to stay and it's becoming more and more uh, affordable, more or more accessible. You say, but it's not so, and I think you put a lot, uh, much more than, than, than you should on, on that uh, asymmetry, that military drones depend on the uh, larger scheme of uh, support of surveillance and uh, satellites and uh, uh, everything. Uh, that's, uh, that's state of art of the technology as of today. But in the future, it might, might change. So it's possible that other side could get the same technology. Uh, in that case, uh, the problem would be, would be the, the right thing for them to do the same thing that we are doing to them now. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that at some points there is a, an impression that you pull uh, a kind of entitlement to moral supremacy from the fact of technological mm -hmm. and military supremacy. Mm -hmm. So that, that that's that's something that might, might be 
uh, might be uh, uh, put there. Uh, there are some, the job of philosophers is uh, clarify, clarifying uh, conceptuals, of course. So uh, it, there is a, a, a focus on civilian, for civilians and human shields. Civilians are those technicians 5,000 miles away civilians or uh, military personnel, uh, which might be important because of mm -hmm. uh, making them legitimate targets. Human shields. Human shields uh, are very obscure concepts because they are uh, different situations which are so much different that they shouldn't be covered by one uh, unified concept. One is, for example, that you guard uh, by force some people uh, placing them in front of you by force. The other is that, that uh, those in front of you are your sisters or mothers or, or daughters uh, trying to protect you. Uh, in both cases, you would have uh, something that is looking pretty much the same, but uh, the moral qualification of, of, of those should be very, very uh, different. And uh, what uh, else? Yeah. The, the, uh, I, I told you that I will defend Wolzer, and Wolzer is making that uh, distinction between war zone and peace. And he said, in, in a zone of peace, targeting mm -hmm. it, killing is absolutely ruled out. So that's what's making the uh, situation in Philadelphia different from yeah. in, in Yemen. Uh, making uh, the distinction between arresting and capturing. Mm -hmm. In Yemen, you would uh, capture or kill without. But in Philadelphia, you are not entitled to capture mm -hmm. because you have to arrest. Right. That's that's uh, uh, that situation, uh, but uh, in a way, uh, the 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 peace or the zone of peace, which is uh, s uh, the, the the goal of war, uh, should end. So all zone of war, zones of war, should should end in a, in a peace at some point. In that, in that case, uh, it, it should stop, and the difference between those on those two sides should disappear. But, and perhaps uh, I, I think I, I uh, spent too much time already. You said that uh, uh, how to use them, and then omitted Michael Gross and saying Bolzer, McMahon, and Stuttman. But uh, what Michael Gross would say how to use them? That might be a question of interest there. Uh, so uh, those, uh, let me see, just the, the add one, one more. Uh, regarding the, something that you uh, had near the, uh, uh, the end of your talk, uh, by broadening uh, of possible targets because of the easiness of, uh, of the technology, you may be tempted to uh, kill or, or uh, incapacitate, actually, that's the that's the, 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 the aim, not, to, not necessarily to kill uh, all those who are enemies. But uh, it may be becoming too easy, uh, too tempting uh, to do something just because you can. And Walter has that, yes. simply because you can, you can get it. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a problem there. If we devise technology that can, say, uh, let's say, read uh, our thoughts, uh, we might be killed because of having illegitimate thoughts, because some, some machine from somewhere uh, is uh, <laughs> following us. 
and in the same line uh, if you are and that would approve, be approved by McMahon I think uh, if you are going up uh, in the ladder of responsibility you uh, wouldn't be in danger that you couldn't put a specific point because you may go up and up or until those who may that's something that is similar to what Alexander said to those who, who made the final decisions those who so the politicians uh, the, the, the internal logic contained here uh, how uh, somehow makes very hard to uh, distinguish between military personnel and those who are actually not military but responsible uh, for devising technology or uh, issuing orders or uh, uh, conceiving strategies or whatever uh, uh, there is and as a matter of fact I think uh, there, there is a danger there because on the side of uh, those who, whom you call terrorists uh, all those features are mixed in a way, political okay. and... Can yeah. I start from the end? I'm going to start yeah. from this. Uh, yeah. And you are killing their leaders. Yeah. Expecting them to try to kill your uh, military personnel up to the level of colonels or perhaps generals, but right. not ministers or right. uh, members of the government. Okay, so I'm going to start from that. Well, Thank you so, so much. So yeah. Um, okay, so I have to start from the end. I, I'm going to answer briefly, and um, I know a lot of people disagree. The distinction between politicians or between civilians and uh, combatants that we respect very much within, um, I don't know, the first world or however you want to call it, is a product of use in Bello. We kill combatants, we don't kill civilians. Now it's not very logical because the President of the United States is Commander-in-Chief. Nevertheless, in order to safeguard the civilian sphere, that's prohibited. But terrorist organizations deliberately blur this distinction. There is no such distinction within terrorist organizations. So I really don't care. I'm very happy. I think everybody in a terrorist organization is a liable target. Um, I think if we can kill more terrorists, that's good. Uh, and I think that that is very much represented by this policy. Now, if we kill people who aren't terrorists, that's bad, right? But if we're killing people who are combatants, people who are the instigators, organizers, who make the orders, who send people, the, the engineer of, of, of uh, you know, terror attacks and so on, uh, I don't think that's a disadvantage. I think that's an advantage of drones. Um, there's somebody there who's very eager, I think, to jump in. Did, did, did somebody there want to say something? There was one before you. you, you but then I want to, I, I do want to talk. Yeah, let's wait until tomorrow response to all uh, As much as I can. Yeah. Whatever, that's up to you. Who wants to jump in and the rest of the questions? Okay, second questions. <coughs> okay. So I'll try and do this. Oh, sorry. Oh, so. Yeah. No, no, I want to hear you. <laughs> um, I, I thought that we were doing the seminar, so I cleared. A short comment. Oh wait, wait. No, then we were just going to take people who want to who want to respond to Jovan's yeah. points. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to try and answer Jovan. No, I'm not sure I can answer everything. All right. I'm also I'm also very interested in the technology and the dichotomy between use at bellum and use in bello. Well, I mean that's not even Walter. That's sort of traditional just war thinking. So I, I don't know if I can address this. I I think Walter's right. I think that. Uh, the only way to regulate war, non-relatively or, or so on, is to say, okay, I think Israel's right, Walter thinks America's right, and uh, we have to ignore that. Why are you restricting the area of 
Eu acabei de ver algumas coisas. News in Belas? Não, não, não. Há algumas regarding drones to the United States, Europe e Israel, including India e uh, Russia, que estão in danger de uh, the same, ou maybe. Yeah. Oh, okay, I'm gonna. Uh, or oh, yes, yes, uh, All right. I'm trying to answer point by point. You say if we're not ready um, to die, the Walter says if you're not ready to die, um, you shouldn't have the right to kill, right? Uh, yeah. And, and then he said that about that, Kosovo? Otherwise, it's very interesting wording. He says that uh, without the equal right to kill, yes. or as a rule governor, that's uh, uh, on the other side of the rule governor, do you agree with him? Yeah, of course. Okay. Otherwise, so, we would have Hobbesian uh, state of nature without rules. So rules are, are crucial there. Without that rule, and that's, a, that, that's a very important, war would disappear and be replaced. Oh, I see. But with what? Replaced by crime and punishment, by evil con conspiracies and military law enforcement. Okay, but That's now you're arguing. You're arguing against uh, humanitarian intervention. You're not arguing against drones because when the the, the uh, bombing that took place here, right? It's true the pilots weren't in danger, and they, they were criticized for flying right really high. And, but that's not a drone. That has nothing to do with drones. Yeah, but that, that, and it's the, not targeted killing either. Yeah, but that's the connection with the, the main argument. Uh, of no risk? If, if everybody has the same access, uh, in that case, uh, the supremacy of uh, technological supremacy that, you are, uh, that is uh, one oh. of the uh, hypotheses okay. in okay. your text yeah. would be lost. Okay. okay, so I'll try and answer that. I'm not sure that I get the point about riskless warfare. Riskless warfare, a pilot in a plane is not risking his life, right? Uh, someone uh, uh, shooting a, a long-range missile is not, uh, and we accept all of this. This is part of regular warfare in the modern world, right? Drones aren't any different, that's all I'm saying. They're not different, so you can ban drones, but then you also have to ba ban missiles, and you have to ban piloted aircraft, and that's not gonna happen. It's this discussion really has to do with the levels at which Tamar is out here on one hand and Wolves is out here on another hand. Because well, as I understand, Tamar yeah. is out here about the practicalities of war, about war within the bounds of the concept of war. So yes. let's do it as, in, in as right. riskless a way right. as possible to be as effective as possible, right. Right. subject to certain limitations pertaining to being a good state, right? Subject to use in ballot, yeah. yeah. Whereas Walter seems to be vacillating between uh, trying to uh, uh, draw some uh, broader philosophical principle conclusions from the practicalities of war uh, uh, on one hand, and on the other hand, failing really to, to formulate this as a full-fledged uh, sort of thinking about the social value of warfare. Because what Walzer talks about is the social value of warfare and the military. And it is in this context that we can talk about military valor and the repository of values of society within the military and things like that. But Tamara doesn't talk exactly. about that. Exactly, I thought only that. The moral English also, Walzer actually is putting a very serious question. Is the Adros, uh, is some Adros somehow similar to uh, poisoning wells. No, not all wells, but some some wells. So, are drones uh, like poisoning, poisoning selected wells? Um, I thought that you were asking me, um, what's the difference between drones and weapons that are outlawed, right? Like poison gas with the winds changing? Right, okay. So the difference is, in my view, simply, uh, well, there are two differences. One, I think that um, there was a mutual interest, and that's Walter's uh, changing winds. There was a mutual interest to stop using poison gas. That's why after World War I, there were agreements, and um, 
uh, by World War II it's not used anymore in the battlefield. It just, it didn't pay. I don't think drones are like that, but time will tell. I think it pays for the United States and Israel and, and Britain and so on, and eventually, I agree, India and Russia to use drones, um, but I don't think it will pay for terrorist organizations to use drones. I think it will be very difficult for them, and I think since what they want is to kill civilians and not to create pinpointed attacks, there won't be any reason for them to use drones. That's, that's what I'm saying about the moral superiority and the uh, strategic superiority. They don't always go together, but in this case, I think they do. In order to want to use drones, you have to want to target particular people. If you just want to kill a lot of people, you, can do, you don't need a drone. Yes. Just like my main, my main uh, point is, would that moral superiority be lost <coughs> the point of universal access to them? There can't be universal access because, because states have anti-aircraft devices that are probably going to be able to overcome most drones that groups can get. I agree with you. I think in the technology of the future, right, maybe Hamas will have drones, maybe Hezbollah will have better drones, maybe Al-Qaeda will have drones, but um, there's so much anti-aircraft technology within Western states, they won't be able to do much with it. I see. So you have to have weak uh, and rogue states to have that. Uh, otherwise, if, otherwise uh, it would be possible to, to do that uh, in, let's say, Pakistan, yes. like it's not possible yes, in India. Yes, exactly, exactly. I think so, and I think something else, which is that if a terrorist organization wants to harm Israel or the United States or Serbia or France, it's much easier for them. There are all kinds of things that they can do that we can't defend ourselves against. They can send in someone with the germ of the Black Plague to walk around the supermarket in Philadelphia, and there's nothing we can do. But a drone, we can shoot down. So it's not a particularly good technology for an organization. That, that's what I'm arguing. And that in this case, not in every case, the asymmetry, the strategic asymmetry, is actually a moral advantage. Okay. That's what I. But I may be wrong. This is supposed to be a public question. Okay, uh, but I, I had just the final point that makes the technology very, very late. So for those interested more, I would suggest uh, the short novel of Arthur Clarke named Superiority. <laughs> You know that no, uh, the, 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 the story actually. Okay, we have so much to talk about, and I so much appreciate your comments. Maybe we can we can talk at dinner no, course, also, course, and, course, and we'll. I, I am apologizing to the rest that uh, uh, I think. Uh, no, no, I, 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 I also I also got uh, caught up in it. Uh, so we'll we'll no. talk at dinner. Just a few points on 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 the fact that uh, your approach uh, when you talk about the moral and strategic advantages of drones. You, 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 your claim is based on really, uh, I mean, uh, empirical facts now, what we know now right, about so, drones. Yeah. But I was wondering, I mean, the best way to develop a technology is to use it right. and to invest in it. So if you say, I mean, I can imagine a future in which uh, we have used so much do drones and so they are, I mean, they exist in a perfect, in, in a perfection and sophi highly sophisticated version, but many, many states use them because right. it's, it, there is a game of competition, of course. Right. Then so there will be a market of drones that will, will be more accessible by, I mean, many states, not only the good ones. It's, it's the market, it happens. Yeah. And I was just wondering then, also bad states will have drones. Yeah. So, uh, should, shouldn't be this fact taken into account? I mean, I'm trying to ask you this question. When I say good and bad, yeah. I'm not saying the West and the rest. Yes. I'm saying, I I'm not what claiming this. will you do with a drone? A drone is a precision weapon. It's a weapon for states or groups yes. that want to hit particular people but not kill civilians. All right, That's what I mean by good. If you want to carry out a mass attack, you don't need a drone. It's not good for that. But 
Yeah, so you're talking about not the bad states, but about the terrorists. Uh, I'm talking uh, about good in the sense of states that want to comply with use and yes, bellow requirements. Was, not was, states that I think are good. States that want to kill combatants and not civilians. Yes, I, I, I perfectly see your point. Yeah. I was just wondering if, I mean, there is not, uh, by legitimizing now the use of drones, uh, shouldn't be calculated the risk that then yes. they can be spread in the future and so used not only by good states in what yes. sense you prefer, but also by bad states. How? How? You're a bad state. How do you use a drone? What do you do with it? Tell me what you do with it that you can't do today. I, I mean, I, I just talking about the premise of my speech, of my claim You're is right. that by using them, they will be uh, developed uh, and they will be some more sophisticated. So I'm not able now to say exactly in what manner. No, no, but I'm saying no is, you're right. I have no doubt that with the use of drones, and you're right and Michael Walsh is right, more states will get drones. Not only states. I'm telling you, Hezbollah has drones. It's not only a state. But what are you going to do with the drone that you have? If maybe, maybe it will make war better. Maybe everyone. Hamas and Al-Qaeda will start targeting only generals and colonels and so on and not civilians. That would be very good. Okay, so you won't take, you will not take into account in the foreseeable, some foreseeable consequences in yes. the future. That's the, the point. The consequence of what? A drone is a weapon. I mean, what the, are they going to do with it? I just imagine. Let's let's imagine that, that, that there are some remote computers that can come to, to get control of drones. So let's imagine this thing. Maybe in the future it will happen. Yeah. And let's think about terrorist organization that yes. learn to, to to control from remote computers or those kind of terrorist uh, sophisticated have uh, to, to use control. them. So it just but they uh, all right again. Terrorist organizations control. have remotely controlled weapons now. Terrorist organizations have computers and they can send viruses and, and they look what they did in England in the hospital there. Mm -hmm. That's now. But I'm trying to understand what is the moral argument. Don't use drones for targeted killing because then they'll develop no, no. more. I didn't want to, to, to claim that they won't not be used. I was I was wondering if you re if you your reasoning, not to, to claim that they have to be abandoned, not to be used now, but just to take into account also their avoidable yes. and foreseeable consequences. I agree. I agree. Can I just ask you to, 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 sorry, I agree. to contain the question? Uh, no, no, I, I, think, I, I, think, I think people don't fully appreciate the level of infrastructure which is required to actually no, operate a combat drone. It's one thing to have a remotely controlled drone which does whatever you want to do. Exactly. And it's a completely different thing to have a predator drone. This requires the resources of the state. And it's very unlikely that this will be possible for a single computer. But anyway, let's keep to the order of, of questions. Please, please go on. Uh, the, the, the young uh, 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 colleague in the white shirt. Yeah. Uh. Thank you very much. I think it was a, a very uh, brilliant paper. Uh, most of the doubts would be on the uh, perhaps assumptions like uh, legitimate state of war exists and etc. But these are outside the scope of the paper. So uh, I just had uh, actually a minor point and follow up on the previous discussion. Um, I think maybe I missed a, um, a possible confusion uh, uh, among these uh, recent debates is uh, that drones are um, necessarily uh, um, weapons of uh, precision and therefore they are uh, linked to a good state uh, using them uh, more effectively. And I was wondering whether you actually need that claim that, I mean, I, I, I see your point that they are a weapon of precision, but also the argument that they are very cost-effective weapons uh, would seem to imply that they may be used in a uh, massacre by floating uh, states okay. with drones. Okay. But so actually, uh, that's not, that's just a minor point, I think. And, but relatedly, uh, why do you need this claim that uh, they are used, uh, um, they could be more effectively used by good states? Uh, why isn't enough to claim that they are just neutral, like other kind of weapons, and therefore they do not need uh, different treatment than missiles or bombardment? Okay, so first of all, thank you. Drones are new, and my arguments here are new, so maybe I'm wrong. And cost-effective, I was very careful with words. They're cost-effective for states, right? So compared to, I don't know, uh, uh, 
training pilots, they're cost effective relatively speaking. Um, they're not cost effective in the sense that maintaining that whole drone program is cost effective for a terrorist group. Um, and why, why the claim about, um, about good states? Sure, drones can perform a massacre, but it's so much easier to perpetrate a massacre in Tel Aviv or Paris or New York by lower tech, cheaper weapons. Why would you get a drone that's most likely to be shot down by anti-aircraft devices that's expensive in terms of terrorist organization. Why would you do that? Why not just have your cells go and shoot up a, a, a stadium or, or, or spread a disease? It only makes sense to go to all that effort of using a drone if what you're trying to achieve is killing as narrowly as possible, sparing, admittedly sparing your own people, but also sparing civilians. And the reason to spare civilians it's not only because Israel and the United States whatever, are good states, but because they care about what their own populations think, what's thought of them in the world, compliance with international law. If you don't care about this at all, why not just blow up a bomb in the middle of a, of a population? That's my point. Um, Alexander, do you have organization? Uh, you, you had that one on the yeah, Thank you. Yeah, you said you had some. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, so, somehow related to all this and it, it comes, uh, I come from the anti-militarist tradition and uh, the one which is often rejected on the basis of uh, unrealism. Why I emphasize this is uh, to point to the argument which states that the wars are themselves a necessary occurrence and that by being realistic about their inevitability, we need to strive to offer the strongest ethical prescriptions about how they ought to be waged. Such realism is present in both your and Walzer's papers, uh, if they differ in all other major points. If Walzer's paper is primarily against the use of drones, his realism comes to the fore in the conclusion that he offers. I'm thinking of his call for the establishment of moral rules by the first country to use the drones on a large scale, the US. Uh, he's called to proclaim and observe a code for this kind of warfare. But in your text, also, the realism of drone warfare is very strongly asserted and uh, that is what you also pointed here. First and most obviously, I quote, regardless of academic debate, drones are here to stay. Um, in addition, encountering Walzer's apocalyptic argument that we may imagine the world where everybody has drones, you point to the fact that drones are, and I again quote, are, are inherently asymmetrical weapons favoring states, both morally and strategically, adding that this is actually one of their main advantages. So such war realism does not only justify the endless circle of production of new asymmetries and concomitant mushroomings of ever new terrorist groups, but is in its essential asymmetricality fated to remain forever irregular, that is unregulatable, I would say. The strongest state that used a made device, according to Walzer's injunction and in your own statement, certain forms of legal arguments which would either curtail or enhance the use of drones. Such legal arguments would concern themselves with what, for example, James Whitman defined as use victoria. However, it seems to me that any claim to morality of this radically new use victoria needs to also entail certain moral imperialism, or, or at least some sort of imperialism that comes with maybe what Sasha said previously. So you say in the text, such a symmetry may seem unfair, but it's not because uh, it is not unfair because uh, it is used by the good guys, uh, quote unquote, good guys. Drones entail certain kind of superiority of those that use them, or as you say, they're essentially weapons of powerful states. I think that this is the problem that all of us are here somehow trying to emphasize, the powerful yeah, states. You're uh, only to perceive that this type of asymmetry or double standard, as you say, enabling law-abiding states, how do we know that they are law-abiding? Uh, I'm, I'm uh, yeah. close to the end. So enabling law-abiding states to fight safely against terrorists who cannot respond in kind is a good thing, end of quote. I'm not, of course, taking sides with the terrorists here, but what I want to stress is the cost of realism. Uh, reminding ourselves that I come from this unrealistic tradition of anti-militarism. So my question would be, does being real about the war, now 
the drone warfare, include also accepting some kind of imperialism, which then becomes integral part of our moral arguments, ethical prescriptions. Okay, um, two things. First of all, I would not um, consider Michael Walzer either a realist or a militarist, uh, or myself. Um, so, realism is, 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 I think, in terms of just war theory, is something a little bit more than you're stating. It, it's basically all sphere and love and war, and, and that's not what Walzer or I uh, argue. We are realistic in the sense that war is a reality. I think that that's what you oppose, right? Just accepting it and let's regulate it. I'm not sure I can say a whole lot about that. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that um, war is, what would your non-militarist uh, uh, tradition do if it were actually in government? So, so you know, one, one can hold a view like this as a student, but um, the question is what do we do with the wars that are very, very real in, in the regions where, where we come from? Your second point, oh, thank you first of all for that very thoughtful comment. The second point is I think the one that keeps coming up here, and, and I have to state this again. When I say good states, right, or what you call powerful states, if you want, if you particularly are going to go to all of that effort to use a drone, which is the whole infrastructure and so on, you have to care about distinguishing combatants from civilians. And within just war theory, remember the question that Walter's asking and that I'm trying to ask following Walter. What does just war theory, the just war theory that tells us put ad bellum issues aside, put non-militarism aside and try and regulate war and make it as less hellish as possible, what can it teach us about using drones? And one thing I think that um, just war theory teaches us is use the weapon that is best able to comply with use and bellow requirements. Right? Um, so when I say good states are powerful states, in order to use a drone, to want to use a drone, you have to care. You have to care enough about morality to spend all that money and effort in order to kill so-and-so operatives uh, in Pakistan and Yemen and, uh, and Afghanistan, and not to just drop an atom bomb on them, right? Or drop any bomb on them. Because the United States could carpet bomb these areas, right? I'm not saying the United States is a good country in some uh, theoretical sense. I'm saying it's good enough, right? Not to just bomb the place, um, not caring if they, how many buildings they, they take down together with the terrorists, right? Israel is a good enough, right? You can think Israel does all kinds of awful things, but it's a good enough country to care to pluck out the terrorists and not just to demolish um, how many hours do you think it would take the Israeli army to demolish Gaza? But you have to care enough, you have to be good enough to care not to do that. To care to try and pick out the terrorists and not the civilians. Drones are really good at that. That's what all the buzzing and humming of the, of the surveillance is for. Um, so that's, that's basically the, where the good states come in. They're not good necessarily in the terms of their ends. Um, but everything you're saying is true. Everything everybody's saying is true. They're, it's going to proliferate. It's going to spread. India and, and Russia, of course they're going to have them. I still think it's likely to be more effective in the hands of states that have air level, uh, a state level air superiority and much less effective when you're trying to target states like Israel and the United States that have anti-aircraft. But yes, it's going to spread. Thank you. Uh, I will make a comment. Uh, I will try to make a comment within the parameters of, of your argumentation, which is very challenging, I mean, not to say the least. Uh, things that you discussed, let me, uh, were if drones are effective uh, and that they create some kind of deterrent measures. And the only thing basically that you said negative about drones is that they have certain psychological effect on the population which you did not want to neglect. Right. Now my question is, or, or, or a comment, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not, not sure what I'm doing with this, is uh, do you have, do you people use any kind of algorithms or some kind of calculation if kids are brought up with that buzzing, you know, throughout yeah. their, their, their childhood, how many of them will become fundamentalists? You know, and in, in, a, in a broader level, 
You know, if you build a wall and keep people like in a cage, how many of them will turn to suicide bombers? Uh, you know, do, do, are there any kind of algorithms for that? Because, you know, in my view, if we really, if we narrow our focus on just on these questions and disregard the overall framework of what causes, you know, people to become terrorists, you know, what kind of things are done to certain people to or, or to, you know, to make them become that? I think that for me, that's the true terror. You know. Okay. Okay, so this, it, it really is a little bit outside of the framework, and it, it's an argument, there are a lot of people who argue that the power that should be used by the United States or so is soft power, uh, and not, uh, um, that we shouldn't be resorting to military measures at all. But this doesn't really have to do with drones. I have two answers, so I'm going to answer your political point also. If your point is that Israel and the United States are fighting unjustly, right, against these, um, populations, then that's true of whether we use drones or walls or missiles or, or uh, ground troops or, or anything, right? If the United States used conventional aircrafts, you would say the same thing. So that doesn't really have to do with the use of drones or with targeted killing. Targeted killing is trying, maybe not well enough, but it's trying to protect civilian populations. That's the whole point of targeted killing. The point is to get someone specific and not the children. All right? Now, you're saying if we were better states, there wouldn't be terrorists. This already has to do with the reasons of what makes people terrorists, whether it has to do with circumstance, whether it has to do with religion. Well, why do people in Paris go over to, to Syria to become terrorists? They have good lives there, right? Why did the peoples of occupied Europe under Nazism Right? Fight soldiers and disrupt train schedules. Why didn't they become terrorists? It doesn't really have to do with how bad the occupation is or how, th whatever the reasons that people become terrorists and go out to kill themselves and kill a lot of civilians, it doesn't seem to have any connection to the things that you're saying. Thank you. You, you tackled the, the wider political issue in your way, but right. you didn't tackle this thing. You talk about the tactics, and I'm telling you, you use drone. Perhaps, you know, there is buzzing around. For one kill, you get 50 terrorists. Maybe, you know? but maybe. I don't... Well, not maybe. It's that's not a theoretical theory political theory theory question. The drones, you need you should think I'm not sure that's true. I, I just don't know. Yeah. And you don't know either because their drones haven't been in use for a generation. Yeah, that's, um, that's a general question. And I think maybe you're should, right. I, I don't know. I think we should consider the fact that in democratic states like Israel, there are people on, on, on both sides of the divide. And the majority of the people who demonstrate against the wall are Israelis. Right. So it's a, it's a question of democratic legitimacy. It is not a question of, of the ethical justification of drones. Well, that's that's because, yeah. 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 Or, or Israel. Yeah. Right? I'm saying if you're going to kill people in a war, just war theory tells you do it as targeted as possible with the weapons that enable you to spare as many civilians as possible. Now, maybe we shouldn't be in a war. Maybe we shouldn't be killing anyone. But maybe we shouldn't be, maybe we should be pacifists. But these are really different questions. Um, Thank you. The person who was to ask the next, next question just walked out of the room. So we have another one. Yes. Uh, I'm not a, a political scientist. I'm just a philosopher of law. So my question could be a bit uh, ingenious. For, for you, um, I apologize for that. No, I actually come from law and philosophy also more than from hardcore political science, so that's fine. Yeah, but uh, it's a total new uh, issue for me. Um, uh, I wanted to uh, connect with uh, what David had say, and I, I think that there is a possibility that a terrorist could use drone. I think that uh, they could use drone to kill some information informator, a person who can betray them and uh, give you uh, give give to the state uh, the good state uh, um, a possibility to defeat them. This could, could be uh, a very very important uh, uh, problem if they get this uh, this uh, this weapon, and um, I I would want to ask to you if you, uh, well, 
if you think that it is possible to substitute an uh, ordinary army with, uh, with, uh, uh, with the drones, and uh, uh, if, uh, if it's so, I, I, I think maybe there will be a problem, because uh, drones seem to me a, a sort of, of uh, at, uh, from your point of view, uh, you're totally right, you will spare a lot, a lot of life, but uh, in, in the long term, uh, you think th that, uh, it seems to me that uh, using, uh, um, using drones is uh, like to think about the uh, other population, like somebody you don't want to kill. Right. Okay, that's good, but it's not enough, because, uh, because you have uh, to think about the other population with somebody, as somebody you have to interact. And this is the only way to, 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 no, I, to I, go through the solution of a conflict, I, I think. There's but something we're missing here. No, I, I get your question, and I think it's very much in keeping with a lot of the other things. I'm, defend, I'm defending, and I think here I agree with Walter, targeted killing and targeted killing with drones compared to other wartime measures. Mm -hmm. Of course it's better if there's no war. Of course peace is better. Of course it's better if there's no wall and no but children living under buzzing of drones. The question is, if you're fighting somewhere, what should you do? Should you use drones and kill specific people or should you bomb from the air or send your soldiers in like in Vietnam or uh, uh, kill with poison or whatever? And of all of those, whatever's in the military arsenal, I think drones are relatively good and I think targeted killing is better than untargeted killing. Uh, Peace I, is better than targeted killing. Yeah, yeah. Yes. But I'm not. I'm not, I'm not t telling uh, that. Uh, okay, there. There should be not no war, etc. This is even more ingenious than my than my question is. It's a too ingenious. Uh, I I think that if there is a conflict, the the aim of the two parties should be to find an end of the conflict. I agree. And uh, if you use uh, drones. To uh, use to specific target, it's okay, but uh, use to use only drone and eliminating the interaction with between the, the two population, also the aggressive interaction, should delay the resolution of the con conflict. Can delay, I think. So what would you do? Oh, I, don't, I don't know. This okay. is a, this is a difficult question. I'm not an expert okay. in this, this subject. Uh, Peter, do you want to jump in? Uh, ju just, uh, you, you remember in the United States, he classified several types of arguments, strongest, weaker, remember, and the one place, well, that is the very <coughs> simple and very difficult, I think that this argument could be much more stronger than he mentioned, uh, how to win the war. With the, with the drones. How do you, yeah, alright, well, okay, now I'm going to say something very provocative that I'm only speaking for myself and I'm not speaking for Walter. I think that terrorism, like totalitarian regimes, has to be defeated. I don't think we have to interact with it. I think there, it's, it's a situation of unconditional surrender. Um, so, and, and I, that doesn't have to do with cause. They may have a just cause of liberation. I'm, we're not, I'm talking about terrorism, alright? And so, um, how do you win a war with drones? I think the object is to decapitate the organizations. I don't think you can win, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know, I don't think Michael Walzer knows how you, but I don't know how you win a war against terrorism with bullets or bayonets or poison either, right? So, um, that I don't have an answer to. There's something fascinating in being able to kill the hate person in a precise and short way. There's something morally satisfying about that. It's interesting. It's to me. <laughs> yes, it's a yeah, I just have a, um, a comment going again uh, to this good states uh, issue about um, moral superiority of targeting. Um, it just made me think about, uh, I'm, I, I come from Spain, and it made me think about the ETA, mm -hmm. the um, Basque um, terrorist organization, and they really targeted concrete yes. people. And I have to say something, and, I uh, even call they, them, sorry. Yeah. Right, yes. yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah you, 
maybe it's about uh, which kind of terrorism we're talking about, not terrorism as a whole, maybe. Maybe you are uh, thinking about some specific terrorism, but some of the things that you said don't apply to the ETA, for example, that they uh, don't distinguish, be uh, terrorists don't distinguish between combatants and civilians. The ETA, they distinguished and they targeted concrete people, so drones would have been good for them just to um, yeah, to target a specific um, uh, no people. And then that. also you said that the terrorists, they don't care about what their population think about them, they just uh, no, blow things is. up. And um, they, the, the ETA, they actually cared a lot about what the population thought about them. When they started not targeting so well, when they started blowing things up and killing civilians, um, they cared about that and, the, and their population cared about that and the relationship between the Basque population and the ETA also changed there. So they really deeply cared about the image that their population had about their actions. So yeah, it just made me think about that. I totally agree with everything you've just said. And in fact, I think that a lot of the Basque's uh, uh, guerrilla warfare was not terrorism. Um, and when I say terrorism, I'm following Walter here, who's talking about the random murder of defenseless non combatants I'll say more than that. A lot of the Basque's operations were against infrastructure and, and the property, which I wouldn't call terrorism at all. I'm talking specifically about groups who don't care. I think that what we want to encourage in liberation movements, and this is also to the person who's uh, so concerned about the wall and caging people, and we want to encourage them to act like the Basques. We want to encourage them to kill combatants and not civilians, even to kill political officials, but not children. And if drones can do that, if drones are effective to you, then you're not such a bad group. I think that, that, that's, that that's actually the point. Yes, I can envision a group like the Basques using drones, if they can do it, if there's not too much anti-aircraft, uh, whatever. But if they do, that's good. If we have to fight, and that's to you, it would be better not to fight, but if you have to fight, better that the fighting should be targeted than untargeted. And it's the groups that want to fight in an untargeted way that the groups that I would call bad. It's not that their goal is bad. Some of their goals may be good, um, it's, it's the way that they fight. So I, I accept, right, I take on board everything you said about the Basques, yeah. Thank you. Um, Thank you. 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 Somehow, somehow I don't understand your theory. Uh, you're, you're talking about drones and you're using the world, the world uh, war. Right. Well, for me, I think that drones are for hunting. Okay. That's hunting, that's not war. And uh, let's, let's just look at the numbers. I'm interested in, mm -hmm. I'm interested in numbers. Mm -hmm. let's, let's do some facts. So, in uh, three so-called wars, in Pakistan, Somalia and uh, Afghanistan, uh, your argument that came from utilitarianism isn't good at all. Why? Because, so, from in Pakistan, I just look at the numbers from 2002 until 2011. Jones killed uh, somehow, I think, 8,000 people, and uh, among them, 2,000 were civilians. So, <laughs> Wait, argument I, I, from I, all, utilitarianism yeah. uh, in favor of drones can stand that number. Sure, it can. Listen to me. First of all, the numbers are different depends who you ask. President Obama used to say that there's no collateral damage in the use of drones. Right? Now that probably is an exaggeration. It all depends how you count. And they don't count well because the way the Americans count, Walter says this, they count every male of a certain age between 15 and 65 as a combatant. And that's wrong. And I say it in the paper, that's wrong. But the numbers aren't going to help you because if you say 8,000 to 2,000, most wars today, right, that kill 8,000 combatants, kill a lot more than 2,000 civilians. You're talking about a one to four proportion? That's very sure good. I don't think so, I'm not sure about it. Okay, you're, what you're because saying- We had, yeah. so, here, 1999, we had 
they're getting uh, killing without drones or that mm -hmm. was only to getting uh, my side, my side, so what? Yeah? Right, and how many civilians were killed? I think much less than in drones. Less than four to one? Yeah, I think so. I can't imagine, because in World War II, 50% of the casualties were civilians. You're saying 25% of the casualties why, are civilians. Why, why are you always in favor of, uh, of drone attack uh, when you have, uh, when we have, in fact, in a, in a, in a reports that drones are used for uh, signature attacks, attack mainly by USA, than for personal attack. Ah, all right. I mean, so, first. If there, if there is a personal attack, that's a assassination, that's not war. No, if no. If there is a signature attack, that's a hunting, that's not war. Okay, I don't agree, I can explain I mean, to you why. I don't know if everybody... We can only speak about war on terrors. War on terror, nothing else. Yes. If that's war, that's a question. But we started with that. Uh, and the assumption here is that it, those are the wars that we fight today. Right? The United, England isn't fighting France. The, the fight is with terrorist organizations. If the laws of war have any application, they have to apply to the wars we're actually fighting. Now, there are two types of uh, drone strikes. There are signature strikes and personality strikes. You're right. Evidence indicates that most of the strikes are, of the United States, unlike Israel, are actually signature strikes. 95%. No. OK, right. 99%. Right. But signature strikes actually look a lot more like war. In signature strikes, yes, the it's United funny. States, no, it's the funny. United States strike, strikes at targets that have the signature of a combatant. Their military training camps. Was there, was there a declared war? No, but there are no wars like that anymore. There's no war like that There's anymore no in the world. Because, okay, so, but, yeah. but then, all right, so then what you're saying. Is that war? These are the wars that we are fighting today. Uh, your, your rules may apply to wars that we fought 100 years ago, but there are no wars like that. So then it all becomes theory. What would you do, what would you do in a war with a terrorist organization? Give up? Or fight them. Right. So you have to fight them. So yeah. fight them by what rules? Just war yeah, theory. Fight. Where, if, where do you want to fight? Infinite. If everywhere is war, then for sure somewhere is war. Sure. No, not everywhere is war. Philadelphia, Michael so Walter you tells you so. Why? Uh, uh, war on the terrorists. That's war on the on the on the cold bombs. No, no, no. Yeah? no. The idea is that it's there. Not, it's not a sea war, it's not a continental war, it's not a war, it's, it's everywhere, yeah? There's no, there's no space. Yeah, but nobody's. Except, no, except, uh, uh, except war, yeah? No. Uh, actually, one of the things that Walter says and that uh, Jovan was talking about is that there are zones of peace and zones of war. Nobody argues that you can use a drone to target a terrorist in Philadelphia or in Tel Aviv or in uh, Belgrade. The argument is that, and this applies particularly to the signature strikes, is that areas where terrorist organizations have training camps and command uh, centers and so on are military targets. And if you see what they do when they perform signature strikes, whether you accept it or not, it's very similar to bombing a military camp from the air. They're just doing it with drones. There are areas in which terrorists are training operatives. Now, why is that not war? And why should that be unintentional if there is a collateral damage? Why should collateral damage should be unintentional? Because it's what you're trying to avoid. You don't want there to be collateral damage. They want it. Who wants it? You say one to the United Nations, uh, Chinese embassy to be collateral damage. But then it's not collateral damage if you want it. Yeah, they to be said damage. it is a collateral damage. Okay, okay let's but, uh, continue. But that has nothing Certainly, to do with targeted and, uh, killing. Uh, my, my, I think my comment ties in well with Rastko because okay. I'm also going to focus on the problem of the logic of utilitarianism that I think your argument relies on. Now, I have no clue about just war theory about that Usain Bell and other stuff, I'm a sociologist, but um, I would like to uh, suggest one kind of uh, measure of caution regarding your argumentation. Now, uh, you start from the most fundamental theoretical premise that the war on terror is more or less identical to normal warfare and that the rules of just war in normal warfare 
can without problem apply to war on terror. Now, I see one fundamental difference between standard warfare and, and uh, war on terror, and that doesn't have to do with asymmetry. Uh, I think it ha even more fundamentally has to do with the time frame and uh, with the prospect of ending. Now, in normal warfare, you have the prospect of uh, imminent end, more or less imminent. Now, you're speaking about three, four, five years. And this time frame, I think, is very constitutive for the kind of rules that apply in just war. Now, at one point, you mentioned that collateral damage in standard warfare can be justified. Am I right? Yes. And I assume that the logic of this justification is utilitarian. So collateral damage can be pardoned, can be justified if the aim of the operation undertaken, if the successful operation saves thousands of other lives or brings the war closer to closure. I so assume the justification that is if you achieve the military, uh, the military target. In other words, right. it has to be proportionate in relation to the military advantage. I understand. It's still a utilitarian yes, justification. Right. Yes. Now, the problem with uh, the war on terror is that um, this kind of logic of justification, the utilitarian logic, which means we uh, unintentionally kill civilians, uh, deprive some people of lives, but we save countless other lives, when it is... Uh, extrapolated onto an unlimited period of time, then you start something that I would call a negative moral learning process. At one point you said that drones can trigger actually a moral learning process, that they make us more sensitive to issues. Right. And no, I think, yeah, yeah than then, then we, right. we, we used to be. However, I think there is also a negative moral learning process. And that means if you have uh, years and years of drone strikes, if terrorist suspects get more, more uh, proficient in, in erecting human shields, in maximizing collateral damage. And on the, other, on the other side, no one among military personnel involved in drone strikes is prosecuted for collateral damage. Then you trigger a negative moral learning process where you are constantly arguing, well, of course, there is more collateral damage, but imagine how many lives would be lost if we didn't do this. In the end, you have opened the door to a fundamental undermining of the democratic institutional system in the home countries, which is fundamentally opposed to utilitarian logic. It is based on the Kantian logic of the invi inviolability of human life, where you can't break the categorical imperative and kill one person to save five other persons within that state. I think it's a corrosion process. Wait, 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 wait. Kant was no pacifist. All Sorry? Right? Kant is not I know, a pacifist. That doesn't have to do anything right? with this. No, the argument here is not utilitarian in the sense of we'll kill one person in Pakistan and save five. The argument is the argument of self defense. The argument is we'll save people in the United States by killing people who are attacking us from Pakistan. That's the argument. It's not utilitarian of, uh, you know, we'll uh, cut up one person and give his organs to fi save five people. That is not the logic. The logic is we have a right to defend ourselves, right? There's no, there's no ad bellum proportionality requirement. I, the President of the United States has a right to defend people in New York from a terrorist attack. And if the uh, attacker is coming from Afghanistan, right, this, this, is, this is the logic, then we have a right to kill him. We know that killing him will sometimes cause collateral damage, but that's both legally and on classical just war theory um, legitimate, right? It, it's not a utilitarian argument in the way that you're presenting it. Uh, all right, let, let me give you, an, let me give you an, an, an analogy, right? If 100 people want to kill me, I have a right to kill all of them. I don't have to kill just one of them and let the other 99 kill me. I, it's, not a, it's not that kind of a balance. They're, they're what aggressive. What I, was saying. what I was saying is if there is more and more collateral damage and no one gets prosecuted for that, that triggers a negative moral learning process where we become more and more utilitarian. And this carries over into the larger society after a while. I mean, we, we can already see that happening. 
in the United States. Maybe, but that's but but that's not all right. That's not just an argument against just war theory when you're talking about prosecution. That's a, that's an argument against international law of armed conflict. You cannot prosecute someone for proportionate collateral damage. And since there's no algorithm to say what is proportionate and what isn't, that's not a prosecutable offense. Um, what they are Certainly is, not four to one. Also, there is a categorical difference between war and terror and standard warfare. So You're right. Like there's a stuff. difference. I don't think it's a categorical then difference. There's a difference. You can't apply the same rules. Okay, so then maybe... But, but then what you're saying is that no rules apply. Because these are the rules that we no, have. No, I say tighter rules apply. More prosecution for collateral damage than in normal warfare. That would be my answer. There's no Sorry. prosecution for collateral damage in normal okay. warfare. Okay. Um, and there's much less collateral damage with drones than in normal warfare. Uh, that, that, that sort of yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I was going to ask a question uh, relating to, so just to kind of shift the focus uh, from this attacking on uh, uh, what they were talking about, just if we agree with your argument. Uh, we have to expect that the terrorist organizations will straight, uh, change their strategy accordingly. So they're not just going to be, okay, now there's drones and we're going to get our leaders killed and there's nothing we can do about it. We're going to run to the hills, as you said at one point. I don't think that this is how this plays out. And uh, I see a problem with that argument because I think what they're going to do is actually run to the towns in order to protect themselves and not just use human shields in the uh, practical sense but also capture those towns and make everybody in those towns uh, militants as well and then it becomes really difficult to distinguish uh, who is uh, actual terrorist and who is being made a terrorist because their town is captured and maybe there's a problem like what is happening with ISIS now. They're becoming more and more territorial. So it's not a standard kind of uh, terrorist organization. No, but they want to be territorial. That's why they call themselves the Islamic State. Exactly. Right? So are more and more terrorist organizations are going to try and be territorial in order to fight this uh, uh, the strike from the air because they're going to be afraid if we use old non-territorial tactics we're going to end up in the hills just waiting for a bomb to fall on our head so we're going to have to become territorial which actually uh, threatens this region which is uh, has uh, very little sub sovereignty to begin with so there's going to be more and more warlords trying to protect themselves by trying to recruit the whole towns for their cause. I, I fear that a lot of what you're saying and what you said too, too about the um, um, proliferation of collateral damage is true. It's true. But again, you can sit back in, in, at the universities and but, but your arguments are basically not to fight them. That's what I'm trying to understand. To fight them with lower tech weapons that will kill more people. Th those are the options we have. We can not fight terrorism. We can fight them with planes. We can fight them with ground forces. We can fight them with poison. We can fight them with drones. This is the choice. So are you recommending we don't fight them? Ooh. Terrorists, yeah. No, I said we need to have tighter rules for fighting with drones. That was my... Oh, okay, good. I'm... All right. My I'm actually... I actually don't disagree with that. Um, I don't think that we need tighter rules. We need compliance with the rules that um, that exist. Uh, standard warfare rules, I think, are too lenient in this okay. context. Okay. okay. So, okay. so yeah, just to round up, that was uh, uh, there was more of a question since I see this playing out and I'm not a military strategist, but the logical thing would be to try and become more territorial in order to have this argument of, uh, see, there's people around me that aren't there. Uh, what is the next step in this regard? I mean, how do drones uh, uh, become ineffective in the sense in, let's say, 30 years' time? This, this Why? But the drones are designed in order to pick out the terrorists from within the population. <laughs> we, if they're in the hills, we don't need drones. If they're in the hills, we can bomb them with a regular aircraft. The drones, the, the, the precision weapons, is in order to pick them out of Gaza. You know, there are 10,000 Hamas militants in Gaza and a million and a half peaceful civilians, right? And, and, and this is where the criticism about, uh, about harm to civilians comes in. The idea of drones, and Israel actually doesn't use drones that much in targeted killing because it's, it's a very small area. They do it more with manned aircraft. But the idea of targeted killing is that you try and kill only the militants. Okay, but maybe this is a technical question. Drones can actually pick militants out of the population. I don't, they can do it better than other weapons, right? Okay, so I have a question that's connected to this 
issues, but from a slightly different angle. Uh, namely, uh, I agree that drones are here to stay and that we cannot simply dismiss them, but I'm concerned whether current uh, modern democracies have the capacity con to control the rules of their deployment. I mean, this debate is perhaps very important because much of the drones, uh, drone, drone strikes are left without proper rigorous analysis, uh, both in media and uh, investigative journalism. It goes like a stealth beneath our moral, moral radar, and that's a huge problem because then other uh, uh, government secret agencies that operate drones uh, can actually fabricate the, their precision. I think that their precision is uh, uh, a myth, uh, not, not a myth totally, but it's gro exactly. grossly uh, exaggerated because it, it relies upon definition of what a combatant is I on agree. the one side and on the other side on, on, on stuff like, I, for instance, I, I read this on, on, on uh, NBC, uh, MSN, NBC uh, found some secret document, I don't know which one, which stated that the Justice Department uh, uses the definition of imminent threat that states that the United States does not require to, require to have a clear evidence that a specific attack on US will take place in the immediate future. This is a really weird usage of the word imminent. Well, because right. it is unclear and when you use this kind of vague definitions, a slingshot can be made in a super precise manner. So that's, I think that the debate is more important uh, also prosecution, if uh, uh, tighter rules, but uh, also more investigation into how they are deployed with great skepticism about this technological optimism that, you know, we can pick them up as okay. easily as that. Okay, so, so first of all, um, I agree. I think there are a lot of second-order concerns uh, about drones that does, doesn't make them any less um, important. In other words, you could agree that targeted killing, in principle, um, is, is more desirable than untargeted killing and the drones have the capacity to be more targeted and at the same time say yes but the United States um, isn't being transparent, they're not being honest, uh, you can't say that everyone in certain regions between 15 and 65 every male is a combatant, Walt just said that he's absolutely right, um, you can't say everyone who's walking around there and huddling together has the signature, all of this is true, um, it doesn't so much pertain to the uh, uh, principled uh, argument. Um, yeah, I think I think that these concerns exist, but I, unlike the two of you, think that uh, we should apply the same restraints that we would apply in regular war, because in regular war, armies also lie and generals lie and um, and, and so on. So you need uh, military lawyers supervising them and, and so on. I'm not sure that I would have different rules. But but when, when, when the general slide, you know, there, there are, you know, uh, newscasts over there, they, they, there is a much tighter control over whether or not they are lying. But when you have drones and they're like, today we killed two people, or, you know, the, the very first usage of drone in 2002 or what, they did not have a clear number of how many combatants were killed. That was contested whether five or six, or yes. that, that was the government on the very first occasion of using these super precise Yeah, I agree, drones. I agree. There, there, there are additional concerns here. Um, but, and here the criticism is of the policy and the policy maker, and I, I think that we should be very vigilant and, and, and watchful about these things. It seems to me that there's a lot of concern, underlying concern about the fact that drones give you a sense of power. The drones give you a particular type of discrete sort of power to control events, which many people are just uncomfortable with because it, it just doesn't apply to many other models of uh, I think that's true, though it does apply again, long range missiles, bombing from the air, um, and so on, and many more people are killed by, by those types of weapons. Uh, I would like to refer to what the uh, uh, also better uh, with, say, before, uh, uh, can you beat, can you win uh, uh, that particular war uh, with this, uh, in this, in, in, in this way? And I think that uh, what uh, uh, Marian and Rasko 
when thinking about cor uh, corrosive impacts of uh, the whole process is not restricted to the proliferation of, uh, as you said, collateral damage, but it's corrosive in much deeper sense. So it's, it's uh, something fundamental. Uh, the question is, can you solve the problem in that way or vice versa, you are actually deepening it? I don't know. Uh, that, but that, that's, that's the issue. And, uh, you said uh, uh, totalitarianism and terrorism must be defeated in the way of, uh, which is uh, non-conditional, uh, yeah. etc. Et but uh, it seems to me that uh, the, 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 the two are very different from each other, totalitarianism and terrorism. Totalitarianism is just a fiction, ideological fiction, uh, in a way very uh, enticing, irresistible way uh, to think in a Manichaean way, uh, but terrorism might have some real causes. And, uh, do you think what that is ISIS's real cause that's so different? I mean, you know, Nazi Germany had some very real causes Nazi, as well. Nazi, Nazi Germany is, is more similar to the case of totalitarianism. Yes. But, but uh, what Paolo said, you, may, you, you kill one leader uh, and you said uh, you may decapitate them and they will become calm. No, and you I have, didn't you say that. would have a peace. But would that peace be just or unjust? So, what Peter said, can you win in that I, way or not? If you cannot, it's just a proliferation, not uh, of collateral damage, but proliferation of <coughs> conflict. It is not conflict-solving strategy. It's not the matter of uneasiness because of the new technology that makes us uh, uneasy because uh, we find it very strange <coughs> and very uh, uncomfortable. But uh, actually producing, or uh, maybe not producing, but somehow putting aside the real problem by giving us a show that we are doing something while actually we are not doing anything contributive to the uh, <coughs> final result, which is supposed to, 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 to be uh, getting rid of the causes of the conflict meaning the peace. Okay. So here, um, and this ties into to what was said before about wars being three years or five years, and the idea that just war theory, the, the, the purpose of theory. the war is to bring a just peace. I agree with all this, and that's why you argued that the, the laws don't apply to this type of, of conflict. Theory doesn't, doesn't help that. No, uh, that, theory that. doesn't help here. I don't know. We're talking here about targeted killing and targeted killing with drones. I don't know that the war against terrorism can be won at all. I have no idea. Think how uh, unsure in 1941 or 1940 it was that Nazi Germany could be uh, Nazi Germany could be is, defeated. Is, is, is a bad that's the argument about Hitler. That's a very bad kind of argumentation. Uh, why wouldn't you allow that the, uh, the solution would be uh, trying to find? Uh, find this, uh, because I don't think solution. that organizations like ISIS are organizations in which there's any possibility of finding any kind of common ground. Now they may win or they may lose, but I don't think there's going to be some sort uh, of a solution. ISIS shouldn't be confused with some other organization like Hezbollah or Hamas, which are uh, uh, coming out from some uh, real uh, feeling of despair and humiliation. ISIS is a kind of if, if you allow me, yeah. uh, that very uh, simplified uh, approach that ISIS or Nazism or uh, any kind of totalitarian is, is a kind of arrogance. And on the other side, you have a uh, 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 desperate reaction from the uh, position of helplessness in a uh, in, in situation where you are feeling that you are humiliated. Those two, uh, two are very different from each other. In the second case, you are supposed to find the causes and get rid of that, not decapitate those who, who dare to uh, protest or uh, rebel or whatever. But that, that, that's how okay, look, with what, what Paulus was thinking by, by saying <coughs> you uh, kill one of the leaders 
and then there would be a 50. Yeah. Uh, this, this, is, this is such a difference in world view because I think that the arrogance is actually coming from, uh, from the, other, the other point. Uh, without um, minimizing the suffering of individual Palestinians or individual people in Pakistan or whatever, I don't think that they're that different. I think that um, terrorism, and, and, and this even, I think even Michael Walter would agree with me, that terrorism in the form of randomly killing civilians is a relative of genocide, is a relative of totalitarianism. Um, and again, I'll say that the, the resistance movements against Nazi Germany, who were humiliated and harmed and so on, didn't blow up uh, uh, um, civilian uh, Germans and children, right? They fought in a much more, the French resistance didn't fight the way the Hamas fights. They were in a much more desperate situation against a far more vicious um, uh, enemy. In fact, no resistance movement in Nazi, under Nazi Germany, under Nazi occupation, fought in this way. There's something very, very special about fighting in the way that Hamas fights. And it's much more similar, in my view, to ISIS. And so on. I think ISIS is because so many people in Europe didn't realize uh, uh, what Israel was facing and later what the United States was facing. And now Europe is facing the same thing. Yeah, I know. But the folks said that in a pursuit of finding the solution to the supposed to be the solution to the solution to the solution to the to uh, get rid of the causes of the problem. Mm -hmm. And minimizing suffering is not the strategy. It's not the issue of minimizing suffering. It's uh, the issue of uh, looking out the causes of what's the source of the suffering. But I agree. Let's say Israel can do that with the Palestinians. Maybe. I agree. But I'm not sure that we can do that with ISIS, or we can no, do it with global terrorism, or that the United States can do it with Al Qaeda and associated forces. Or, 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 or. Right. And I agree with you. With national uh, liberation movements, even if they resort to methods that I think are very close to, to genocide and so on, yes, you're right. The, obviously, the, the solution is, the long term solution is some sort of peace negotiation. I agree. No argument. But first of all, the question is what weapons to use so long as you're fighting. Israel actually doesn't use drones for targeted killing so much. It, it targets from, with manned aircraft much more. Um, but that means that uh, but, uh, non conditional surrender of the other side is not, uh, not... Not of the Palestinians, that's not what I meant. Of terrorist organizations, of hardcore terrorists. Of course, but the, Palestinian, uh, the Palestinians and Israelis, is such, it's important to me, but it's such a small story. The main story of targeted killing with drones is Al-Qaeda and the Taliban and now ISIS. And if anyone can tell me what they're fighting about or what the solution is, you, we want to argue about Israel, I agree with you. Um, but if you're arguing the, the larger picture, global terrorism and so on, I'm not sure that's a war we can win. So. But I don't think there's, I'm not sure there is a peace there to have. When it's established, it should be such that it's not a ceasefire. Uh, fighting causes of the future conflict, but a real peace. With who? With who? Yes, I agree, I agree. But with whom? Your ISIS is going to reach a Kantian just peace with you? <laughs> I think talking about Kant in this context is deeply problematic. Yeah. You know who does it? When, when, when Jeremy Waldron writes about targeted killing, he explains why all the Kantian arguments from perpetual peace and the metaphysics of morals tell you exactly what you brought up uh, against snipers and, and, and against the, and, and so on. And it just seems so detached. Um, but both, no poisoning is still alive. Yes, but I think that that's because, but, but actually there's a consistency here. Because well poisoning is indiscriminate. You can't really poison the well of, of one person or of just the soldiers. I, I think, yeah. Changing, changing winds. <laughs> changing winds, right. Thanks. First of all, I want to thank you for obviously uh, challenging lecture. Yeah. Let's say I believe that you have convincingly shown that all objections regarding the use of drones are groundless if we seriously take into account the profits they provide. And if we accept the economy 
uh, such an economy at all. Uh, I will focus here, here on an argument, uh, only one argument, because it presents a unique opportunity to confront views and uh, hopefully to provoke quarrel with Sasha. Uh, namely, uh, when you consider the claim according to which I used the quotation you, you used in this lecture too. Riskless warfare is a bad one in itself, either because it makes one opponent non-threatening and therefore non-liable to attack in self-defense, or else because it is dishonorable, unfair, and lacking in military valor. You rightly observed that such claims usually exclude the historical dimension, which would reveal that Harling flying cannon, long-range missiles, etc., must have also seemed like a terrifying remote control weapons at the time they appeared. Uh, it seems that your answer here is quite sufficient. Using drone capacity to focus on the goal as narrowly as humanly and technically possible, trying to hit the enemy target and preferably none else, and any other use of drones is clearly unacceptable, unacceptable as is any other use of a slingshot or any other weapons. Therefore, Complaints about misuse and overuse of drones should be aimed at specific policies and policy makers rather than at the technology. However, Alexander Fatic has a different pos position, and he will correct me if, I'm, if I miss something. The use of drones failed to satisfy any of the four conditions for the justified use of military. The drone operator needs no courage whatsoever. In riskless and costless drone attacks, there is no willingness to make sacrifice for the cause soldiers fight for. There are no questions of justice, but only a technologi technological task for the drone operator, like a computer game. Finally, to conduct offensive military op operations by the drones, one needs no virtues, no humility, uh, and one does not have a sense of oneself as a part of the military moral community. In response to similar objections, you point out that morally drones have the capacity to minimize casualties among civilians and combatants, and that therefore, according to Strasser's argument, it is necessary to employ uh, unmanned aerial vehicles as opposed to exposing soldiers to unnecessary risk. That is, in certain contexts, UAV employment is not only ethically permissible, but is in fact ethically obligatory. Do you think we are dealing here with a different understanding of morals? Fatic insists on the applied military ethics, which is corrupted by the corporization of warfare, or directly to put it, do you find such a count of moral cost of deploying drones wrong, or inappropriate, or just obsolete? <sighs> Thank you. Okay, so um, I think this goes back a little bit to the non-militarist objection, and here I find myself less militarist than uh, Alexander. Um, I'm not looking for the virtue and valor of, uh, of the military. Um, I think that's probably right, that the four basic uh, uh, virtues, courage and, and so on, except the one I, I, I'm actually not so sure about is, um, is morals, because I think that there are uh, issues of justice, even when you're operating um, a drone. And yes, we've lost a certain um, idealized right, uh, um, virtue ethics. I think that's where, where there is a different kind of morality. I think it's a little bit virtue ethics versus something utilitarian or some sort of combination of Kantian and utilitarian, uh, just worth thinking. Um, yeah, if your ideal are the, the uh, jousting knights of the Middle Ages and so on, I think we don't have that anymore. I don't think that that was so wonderfully ideal um, at the time, either the same military valor had them pillaging through villages, raping women, uh, um, you know, uh, slaughtering Jews, and, and so on. I'm, I'm not sure that these wonderful um, um, ethics of the medieval knights and going on rampaging through Europe on their way to the Crusades is something that we have to uh, want to emulate. But yes, we've lost a lot of that, I, I agree. Um, again, in the drone operators, not in everyone working in the uh, drone programs, because some of those people are on the ground and they have to be on the ground. Walter says this, right? And those people do require a certain amount of risk and courage. And I also think that it's, it's a progression, right? So we didn't have two nights dueling, and then suddenly we fast forward and we have drones. We have uh, right airplanes in which the pilots don't take any risk. They didn't take any risk when they bombed here. 
right? They flew much too high. They, they targeted completely disproportionately. And, they, you know, I'm not taking sides, but I'm just saying everybody criticizes NATO for the way. So there was no risk involved there. And I'll speak also about my own, uh, my own people, Israeli pilots who fly over Gaza and target someone, not with a drone. They're not taking any risk. So it's not really new. It's, it's a progression away from these old-fashioned values. But since I don't idealize war, um, you know, I'm, I'm not crying over the loss of, uh, of, of, of these, uh, these values. So, but I do recognize that, that this is true. I, I, I wouldn't quarrel with, with, with Tamar on this because, because I think our perspectives are complementary. What I'm really concerned about is a social value of war and the military. And, 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 and you know, this we have lost to a large extent. But as far as the ethics of specific military operations are concerned, I would converge with, with, with Tamar in, in what she said. Um, uh, my, my sort of related query would be. Uh, more, more of technical nature. You say in one place that it is reasonable to believe that killing uh, leaders of terrorist organizations will gradually make it harder for the terror machinery to function. It seems to me that this is a, a, a point of contention in much of the discussion and that uh, perhaps it would be more accurate to say that killing such people <laughs> will temporarily halt the effectiveness right, of... Right, it's a short-term goal. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It, 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 when yeah. Mark, I write in a private yeah. I say this. I don't know that it's going to... It's not going to wipe out terrorism. Proponents of targeted killing with or without drones argue, rightly or wrongly, that this is the effect. It has some sort of disrupting effect. It has um, psychological uh, benefits. It has a decapitating effect. It slows them down. It forces them into hiding. Nobody argues that this is the solution. And is there a specific ritual regarding uh, this uh, professional ritual of those operators? They have to learn to discern a uh, group of terrorists from a wedding or funeral party, Right. Which is not easy. So, yeah, but this uh, is a mistake. But mis expertise I agree. Kind of knowledge there. I agree. Uh, the same as with doctors reading uh, some, how to say that, yeah. out of, some uh, pictures, for right? And they make mistakes, they, right? And so, especially at first, yeah. When they are young, yeah. for example, General Crystal apologized to President Karzai uh, because uh, he was uh, some wedding was uh, yes, sort of, right. Uh, he said uh, those uh, young guys in Missouri are inexperienced, but they have to be inexperienced before. Like first, before uh, before they become experienced at some point. Right. And so what's point the point? They, they get a virtual professional professional solidarity. Oh, I see what you mean. And but, it, it's a, but the question is whether that's a moral virtue. It's no, a, no, that's, that's not. It's not a professional virtue. skill. Uh, not the moral virtue. That's the, the same kind of virtue as all experts can. Uh, to, to do yeah. They are very yeah. in a way that is solid and. Right. And some of them are former pilot, pilots, some of the people sitting in those yeah. caravans, yeah. Of course. Um, and they agree with you, actually. Well, some of them, I think. Yeah. yeah. There's also, there's also okay. a point of terminology. I mean, in the military speak, uh, uh, this, this speak which is developing uh, 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 around the uh, use of drones, they, they don't recognize what, what you and I, most of us in, in philosophy, call asymmetri asymmetrical warfare to us. Uh, asymmetry like symmetry is a binary relationship as a uh, you know drones are asymmetrical yeah. weapons as you say but they they immediately react and say okay no 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 no, no. drones are not asymmetrical warfare they are dissymmetrical warfare they have invented this term now which is part of the official security studies which says asymmetrical warfare is when terrorists do it but when <laughs> we as states do it it's dissymmetrical okay, something to, different to defend so. the military here we also mean a lot of things when we say asymmetrical we're not always there do we mean in strength do we mean in morals do we mean right so yeah 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 but you're right of course yeah, yeah. do you speak a lot with the military and, uh, a little bit and each time i get really frustrated frustrated <laughs> yeah uh, please join me in thanking tomorrow for a fascinating lecture